Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, Chloe, and Bella. And as always, I want to remind you, please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell. And today we are going to get into the summary and analysis of book 6 to 8 of Homer's The Odyssey. And without further ado, let's get there. <laughs> Okay, summary and Alice, book six through eight. The summary. King Alcinous and Queen Aridi <coughs> ruled the seafaring Phaeacians on the island of Scaria. The morning after Odysseus' rugged landing, Athena, disguised as a friend, sends their daughter Nossus Nos Nos said that wrong probably, and some of her handmaidens to wash clothes near the spot where the beleaguered hero has collapsed. Nausicaa is a classic noble beauty and seems somewhat attracted to the wayfaring stranger. She tells him how to find the palace and endear him himself to the queen, thus ensuring his safe passage home. Odysseus follows her instructions and is received hospitably at the royal household. He eventually reveals his identity and welcomes the, Fa the Phaeacians' offer to and welcomes the Phaeacians' offer to return to him to Ithaca. First, however, he will tell them of his wanderings. These stories take up the next four books, 9 through 12, the best known part of the epic. The analysis. analysis. The Phaeacian section of the Odysseus, the, excuse me, of the Odyssey seems most likely influenced by fairy tales or folk legends. It fits a genre found in many cultures in which a beautiful, innocent young girl, often a princess, is attracted to a rugged, handsome stranger, who usually is older and always more experienced, <laughs> Sometimes the two end up together more often. The man makes an impression on the younger woman with varying degrees of intimacy and moves on. Even in modern times, this is a popular theme in fiction and drama. In this case, Odysseus, excuse me, yeah, Odysseus acknowledges the charms of the virgin Nausicaa but is intent on returning to Penelope. There is no room for dalliance as there was with Circe or Eclipso. Faye. Phasia certainly is a utopia, with minor exceptions. The people are decent, civilized, and kind. I'd like to go there. Although Athena, now disguised as a young girl, warns Odysseus that the local men never suffer strangers, never suffer strangers gladly. The truth is that there's a long tradition of hospitality and assistance to needy visitors. The Phasians are known for going out of their way to return a helpless stranger to his homeland. This exceeds even the generous welcome that we usually find in the Odyssey and is consistent with the locals' devotion to Zeus, protector of lost wanderers and champion of suppliants. Or suppliants excuse me. Odysseus refrains from assuming the position of a suppliant with Nausicaa, perhaps because she lacks any real power to help him, perhaps because dropping to his knees and hugging her legs might be embarrassingly intimate for the young maiden and cause her to take offense. He has no such reservations of the Queen Aridi and is granted mercy. The island itself is a paradise. We learn that the Phaeacians once lived dangerously close to the wool like Cyclops, but their godlike king in those days, Nausithus, moved them to this land of plenty, luxuriant orchards featuring apples, pears, figs, pomegranates, and more, bear fruit year-round. Vegetables and grains are in abundance. No one goes hungry on Scyria. Phaeacians are not great warriors, but they excel at seamanship, dancing, and sports. During ex exhibition of athletic skills, a youngster calls, called Broadsea embarrasses King Alcinous by openly mocking Odysseus and challenging his athletic skills. The great Ithacan promptly hurls Odysseus farther than any of the younger men can manage. He is equally adept at wit and conversation, convincing his hosts that this is no ordinary wayfarer. When Demodocus, the blind bard, sings of the exploits of those at Troy, Odysseus weeps, causing King Alcinous to suspect that a hero of the Trojan War is among them. Odysseus finally identifies himself and agrees to recount the story of his wanderings. A recurring theme throughout the epic is the conflict between appearance and reality. Athena is a master of disguise, appropriately appearing in whatever form best suits her purpose. She is also one of the great 
the first great makeover artist. When a character under her care, such as Telemachus or Odysseus, needs to be look, look impressive, she devotes her talents to the task. As he prepares for the celebration in his honor, for example, Odysseus receives a typical touch of Athena makes him look taller, more massive, more splendid in every way. Of course, the hero of the Trojan War is no stranger to disguise. He posed as a beggar to enter Troy and inhabit, excuse me, initiated the ruse of the giant wooden horse filled with the Greek warriors, a story retold here. By Demodocus, Odysseus' return to Ithaca will be eased by further disguise. Throughout the story of his wanderings, which he is about to recite, the theme of appearance versus reality complicates and enriches his quest. And that's the end of the summary analysis, chapters 6 to 8. That was fairly short. And we are going to get on to book 9. New Coast and Poseidon's Sun. And let me take a drink of my. There we go. That's how long this one is. Now, this was the reply Odysseus made, Alcanus's king in admiration of men. How beautiful this is to hear a minstrel gifted as yours, a god he might be singing. There's no boon in life more sweet, I say. Then when a summer joy holds all the realm, and banqueteers sit listening to a harper in a great hall by rows of tables heaped with bread and roast meat, while a steward goes to dip up wine and brim your cups again. Here's the flower of life, it seems to me, but now you wish to know my cause for sorrow, and thereby give me cause for more. What shall I say first? What shall I keep until the end? The gods have tried me in a thousand ways, but first my name, let that be known to you. And if I pull away from pitiless death, friendship will bind us, though my land lies far. I am Laertes' son, Odysseus. Men hold me, formidable, for guile and peace and war. This fame has gone abroad to the sky's rim. My home is on the peak sea mark of Ithaca, under Mount Neon's wind-blown robe of leaves. In sight of other islands, Dulichion, same, would Zakynthos, Ithaca being most lofty in that coastal sea, and northwest, while the rest lie east and south, a rocky isle but good for a boy's training. I shall not see on earth a place more dear, though I have been detained long by Calypso, loveliest among goddesses, who held me in her smooth caves to bear to be her heart's delight. As Kirky of, of Aea, the enchantress desired me and detained me in her hall. But in my heart I never gave consent. Where shall a man find sweetness to surpass his own home and his parents in far lands? You shall not, although he find a house of gold. What of my sailing then from Troy? What of those years of rough adventure? Weathered under Zeus, the wind that carried west from Ilion brought me to Ismeros on the far shore, a strong point on the coast of the Kikonos, I stormed that place and killed the man who fought. Plunder we took, and we enslaved the women, women to make division, equal shares to all. But on the spot I sh told them, back and quickly, out to sea again. My men were mutinous, fools on stores of wine. Sheep after sheep they butchered by the serp and shambling cattle, feasting while fugitives went inland, running to call to arms the main force of Kikonese. This was an army trained to fight on horseback, or where where the ground required on foot. They came with, drawn, with dawn over that terrain like the leaves, and blades of spring, so doomed, doom appeared to us, dark word of Zeus for us, our evil days. My men stood up and made a fight of it, backed on the ships with lances kept in play. From bright morning through the blaze of noon, holding our beach, although so far outnumbered. But when the sun passed, toward unyoking time, and the Achaeans one by one gave way. Six benches were left empty in every shift that evening when we pulled away from death, and this new grief we bore with us to see. Our precious lives we had, but not our friends. No ship made sail next day until some shipmate had raised a cry, three times for each poor ghost, Unflushed by the Kikonese on that field. Now Zeus, the lord of the cloud, roused in the north, a storm against the ships, and driving veils of squall moved along, moved down like nights on land and sea. The bows went plunging at the 
gusts, sails cracked and lashed out strips in the big e wind. We saw death in that fury, dropped the yards, unshipped the oars, and, <clears throat> and pulled for the nearest lee. Then two days long and nights we lay offshore, worn out and sick at, dawn, at heart, tasting our grief until a third dawn came with ringlets shining. Then we put up our masts, hauled sail, and rested, letting the steersman and the breeze take over. I might have made it safely home that time, but as I came round Malia, the current took me out to sea, and from the north a fresh gale drove me on. Past Kithera, nine days I drifted on the teeming sea before dangerous high winds. Upon the tenth we came to the coastline of the Lotus Eaters, who live upon the fl that flower. We landed there to take on water. All ships, companies, mustered alongside for the midday meal. Then I was sent out, two picked men, and a runner to learn what race of men that land sustained. They fell in soon enough with lotus eaters, who showed no will to do us harm, only offering the sweet lotus to our friends. But those who ate this honeyed plant, the lotus, never cared to report, nor to return. They longed to stay forever, browsing on that native bloom, forgetful of their homeland. I drove them all three wailing to the ships, Tied them down onto their ro rowing benches and called the rest, all hand aboard, come cl clear the beach and no one taste the lotus or you lose your hope of home. Filing into their places to the rowlocks, my oarsmen dipped their long oars in the surf and we moved out again on our seafaring. In the next land we found we were, found were, Cyclopes, giants, louts, without a law to bless them, and ignorance leaving the fruitage of the earth in mystery. To the immortal gods they ne neither plow nor so sow by hand, nor till the ground, though grain. Wild wheat and barley grows untended, and wine, grapes, and clusters ripen in heaven's rain. Cyclopes have no muster and no meeting. No consultation or old tribal ways, but each one dwells in his own mountain and cave, dealing out, with, out rough justice to wife and child, indifferent to what the others do. Well then, across the wide bay from the mainland, there lies a desert island not far out, but still not close in shore. Wild goats in hundreds brought, breed there, no human being comes upon the uh, owl to startle them, no hunter. Of all who ever tracked with hounds, through forests or had <clears throat> rough going over mountain trails. The isle unplanted and until the wilderness pastures goats alone, and this is why good ships like ours with cheek paint at the bow bows are far beyond the Cyclopes, no shipwright toil among them, shape shaping and building up symmetrical trim hulls to cross the sea and visit all the seaboard towns as men do who go and come in commerce over water. This isle, sea-going folk, would have annexed it and built their homesteads on it, all good land, fertile for every crop in season, lush, well-watered meads along the shore, vines in profusion, prairie clear for the plow, where grain would grow, chin high by harvest time in rich subsoil. The island cove is landlocked, so you need the, no hawsers out, out astern, bows bow stones or mooring, run in and ride there till the day you, your crews chafe to be under sail, and a fair wind blows, you'll find good water flowing from a cavern through dusky poplars into the upper bay. Here we made harbor. Some god guided us that night, for we could barely see our bows in the dense fog around us, and no moonlight filtered through the overcast, no lookout, nobody saw the island dead ahead, nor even the great land would rolling billow that took a, that took us in. We found ourselves in shallows, keels grazing shores so furled our sails and disembarked where the low ripples broke. There on the, bre on the beach we lay and slept till morning. When dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, we turned out marveling to tour the isle, while Zeus's shy nymph Daughters flushed wild goats down from the heights at breakfast for my men. We ran to fetch our hunting bows and long shanked lances from the ships, and in three companies we took our shots. 
Heaven gave us game a plenty for every one of us twelve ships in my squadron. Nine goats fell to be shared. My lot was ten. So there all day until the sun went down. We made our feast on meat galore and wine, wine from the ship. For our supply held out, so many jars were held the Ismaros from stores of the Kikanese that we plundered. We gazed too at Kyclopes land so near. We saw their smoke heard bleeding from their flocks. But after sundown, in the gathering dusk, we slept again above the wa wash of ripples. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose came in the east, I called my men together and made a speech to them. Old shipmates, friends, the rest of you stand by. I'll make the crossing in my own ship with my own company and find out what the mainland natives are. For they may be wild savages and lawless or hospitable and God-fearing men. At this I went aboard and gave the word to cast off by the stern. My oarsmen followed, filing into their benches by the rowlocks and all in line dipped oars in the gray sea as we rowed on and neared to the mainland at one end of the bay we saw a cavern yawning above the water screened with laurel and main, many rams and goats about the place inside a sheep fold made from slabs of stone earth fast between tr tall trunks of pine and rugged towering tall trees a prodigious man slept in this cave alone and took his flocks to graze a field remote from all his all companions knowing none but savage ways a brute so huge he seemed no man at all those who eat good wheat and bread but he seemed seemed rather a shaggy mountain reared in solitude we beached there and i told the crew to stand by and keep watch over the ships of the ship as for myself i took my twelve best fighters and went ahead i had a goat skin full of that sweet liquor that youth you Anathes, son, Moran had given me. He kept Apollo's holy grove at Ismaros for kindness. We showed him there, and showed his wife and child. He gave me seven shining golden talons, perfectly formed, a solid silver wine bowl, and then this liquor, twelve two-handled jars of brandy pure and fiery. Not a slave in Moran's household knew this drink. Only he, his wife, and the storeroom mistress knew and they would put one cupful ruby-colored honey smooth and twenty more of water, but still the sweet scent hovered like a fume over the wine bowl. No man turned away when cups of this came around, a wine-skin full. I brought along in victuals in a bag, for in my bones I knew some towering brute would be upon us soon, all out with power, wild man ignorant of civility. <laughs> We climbed, then, briskly to the cave, but Kyclops had gone afield to pasture his fat sheep. So we looked round at everything inside, a drying rack that sagged with cheeses, pens crowded with lambs and kids, each in his class, firstlings apart from middlings and the dewdrops, or newborn lambkins penned apart from both, and vessels full of whey were brimming there. Bulls of earthenware and pails for milking, my men came pressing round me, pleading, Why not? Take these cheeses, get them stowed. C come back, throw upon all the pens, and make a run for it. We'll drive the kids at and lambs aboard. We say, Put out again on good salt water. How sound that was! Ah, how sound that was! Yet I refused, I wished to see the caveman, what he had to offer. No pretty sight, it turned out for my friends. We lit a fire, burnt an offering, and took some cheese to eat, then sat in silence round the embers, waiting. When he came, he had a load of dry boughs on his shoulder to stoke his fire at supper time. He dumped it with a great ca crash into that hollow cave, and we all scattered fast to the far wall. Then over the broad cabin floor, he ushered to use he meant to milk. He left his rams and he, go and he goats in the yard outside and swung High overhead, a slab of solid rock to close the cave. Two dozen four-wheeled wagons with heaving wagon teams would not, could not have stirred the tonnage of that rock from where he had wedged it over the door sill. Next he, t next he took his seat and milked his bleeding ewes. A practical job he made of it, giving each ewe her suckling thick, thickened his milk then, 
and the curds, and whey. See, it sieved out the curds to drip in withy baskets, and poured the whey to stand it in bowls, cooling until he drank it for his supper. When all these chores were done, he poked the fire, heaping on brushwood in the glary sara. Strangers, he said, who are you, and where from? What brings you here by seaways at fair traffic? Or are you wandering rogues who cast your lives like dice and ravaged other folks by sea? We felt the pressure on our hearts and dread of that deep rumble and that mighty man, but all the same I spoke in reply. We're from Troy, a Cain's blown off course by shifting gales in the great South Sea. Homeward bound but taking routes and ways of commons of the will of Zeus would have it. We served under Agamemnon, son of Atreus. The whole world knows what city he laid waste, what armies he destroyed. It was our luck to come here. Here we stand, beholden for your help, or any gifts you give as custom, is to, our, is to honor strangers. We would entreat you, great sir. Have a care for the gods' courtesy. Zeus will avenge the unoffending guest. He answered this from his brute chest, unmoved. You are a ninny, or else you come from the other end of nowhere, telling me, mind the gods. We Cyclopes care not a whistle for your thundering, Zeus. We're all the gods in bliss. We have more force by far. I would not let you go for fear of Zeus. You or your friends, unless I had a whim to. Tell me, where was it now you left your ship? Around the point or down the shore, I wonder. He thought he'd find out, but I saw through this and answered with a ready lie. My ship, Poseidon, Lord, who sets the earth a-tremble, broke it up on the rocks at your land's end. A wind from the seaward ser served him, drove us there. We are survivors there, good m these good men and I. Neither reply nor pity came from him. But in one stride he clutched at my companions and caught two in his hands like a squirming puppies to beat their brains out, spattering the floor. Then he dismembered them and made his meal, gaping and crunching like a mountain lion. Everything innards, flesh, and marrow bones. We cried, al cried aloud, lifting our hands to Zeus, powerless, looking on at this, appalled. But Cyclops went on filling up his belly with man flesh and great gulps of whey. Then lay down like a mast among his sheep. My heart beat high now with the chance of action, and drawing the sharp sword from my hip, I went along his flank to stab him where the midriff holds the liver. I had touched the spot when sudden fear stayed me. If I killed him, we perished there as well, for we could never move his ponderous doorway slab aside. So we were left to groan and wait for morning. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose lit upon the, up the world, the Cyclops built a fire and milked his handsome ewes all in due order, putting the sucklings to the mothers, then his chores being all dispatched. He caught another brace of men to make his breakfast and whisked away his great door slab to let his sheep go through, but he, behind reset stone as one would cap a quiver. There was a din of whistling as the Cyclops rounded his flock to higher, gro to higher ground in stillness, and now I pondered how to hurt him worse. If but Athena granted what I prayed for, here are the means I thought would serve my turn. The club or stab lay there along the fold. An olive tree fell to green and left a season for Cyclops' hand, and it was like a mast, a luggage of a lugger of twenty oars, broad in the beam, a deep sea going craft might carry so long, so big around it seemed. Now I chopped out a six foot section of this pole and set it down before my men who scraped it, and when they had it smooth, I hewed again to make a stake with pointed end. I held this in the fire's heart and turned it, toughening it, then hid it well back in the cabin under one of the dung piles in profusion there. Now came the time to toss for it, who ventured along with me, whose hand could bear to thrust and grind that spike in Cyclops' eye. When mild sleep had mastered him, as luck would have it, the men I would have chosen won the toss. Four strong men, and I made five as captain. At even, as evening came, at evening came the shepherd with his flock, his woolly flock, the rams as well this time, entered the cave by some sheep herding whim or at God's bidding. None were left outside. He hefted his great boulder into place and sat him down to milk the bleeding ewes in proper order. 
put the lambs to suck and swiftly ran through all his evening chores. Then he caught two more men and feasted on them. My moment was at hand, and I went forward, holding an ivy bowl of my dark drink, looking up, saying, Kyclops, try some wine. Here's liquor to wash down your scraps of men. Taste it and see the kind of drink we carried under our planks. I meant it for an offering, if you would help us home. But you are mad, unbearable, a bloody monster. After this, will any other traveler come to see you? He seized and drained the bowl, and I went down so fiery and smooth he called for more. Give me another... Thank you kindly. Tell me how are you called. I'll make a gift, will you please? Even Kyclopes, Kyclopes, or whatever that's pronounced. No, the wine grapes grow out of grassland and loam in heaven's rain. But here's a bit of nectar and ambrosia. Three bowls I brought him. He poured them down. I saw the fiddle and flush come over him. Then I sang out in cordial tones. Kyclopes, you ask my honorable name. Remember. Where's the here? Remember the gift you promised me, and I shall tell you my name is nobody. Mother, father, and friends, and everybody calls me nobody, and he said, nobody's my meat. Then after, I eat his friends. Others come first, or is it nobody's? I say nobody's. Others come first, there's a noble gift now. Even as he spoke, he reeled and tumbled back with his great head lolling to one side in sleep. Took him like any creature, drunk, hiccuping, he dribbled streams of liquor and bits of meat. Of bits of men. Now by the gods, I drove my big hand spiked deep in the embers, charring it again, and cheered my men along with battle talk to keep their courage up, no quitting now, the pike of olive green, though it had been reddened and glowed as if about to catch. I drew it from the coals, and my four fellows gave me a hand lugging it near the Kyclopes as more than natural force nerved them straight and straight forward they sprinted lifted and rammed it deep in his crater eye and I leaned on it turning it as a shipwright turns a drill and planking having men along the swing the two handled strap that spins it in the grove so with our brand we bored that great eye socket while Blood ran out around the red hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared. The pierced ball hissing, broiling in the roots pop. <laughs> in a smithy, one sees a white hot axe head or an ad adze plunged and wrung in a cold tub, screeching steam, where they make soft iron hail and hard, just so that that eyeball hissed around and spike around the spike. The kyclops bellowed and the rock roared around him and we fell back in fear clawing his face. He tugged the bloody spike out of his eye, threw it away and his wild hands were groping. Then he set up a howl for Kyclopes who lived in caves on windy peaks nearby. Some heard him and they came by divers ways to clump around outside and call. What ails you, Polyphemus? Why do you cry so sore? In the starry night, you will not let us sleep. Sure, no man's driving off your flock. No man has tricked you, ruined you. Out of the cave, the mammoth Polyphemus roared and answered, Nobody, nobody's tricked me. Nobody's tricked me. Nobody's ruined me. To this rough shout, they made a sage reply. Ah, well, nobody's played you fool. Foul, there in your lonely bed. You are no use in pain. Given by great Zeus, let it be your father, beside and Lord, to whom you pray. So saying... They trailed away, and I was filled with laughter to see how like a charm the name deceived them. Now Kyclops, wheezing as the pain came on him, fumbled a wrench away the great door stone and squatted in the breach with arms th thrown wide for any silly beast or man who bolted, hoping somehow I might be such a fool. But I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there huge, how could we slip away? I drew on all my wits and ran through tactics, reasoning as a man will for dear life, until a trick came and it pleased me well. The Kyclops rams were handsome, fat with heavy fleeces of dark violet. I tied them silently together, excuse me, three abreast I tied them silently together, twining cords of willow from the ogre's bed, then slung a man under each middle one to ride there safely, shielded left and right, so three sheep could convey each man. I took the woolliest ram, the choicest of the flock, and hung myself under his kinky belly. 
pulled up tight with fingers twisted deep in sheepskin ringlets for an iron grip. So, breathing hard, we waited until morning. When dawn spread out her finger tips of rose, the rams began to stir, moving for pasture, and peals of bleeding echoed around the pens, where dams with udders full cast for a, called for a milking. Blinded and sick with pain from his head wound, the master stro stroked each ram, then let it pass, but my men riding on the pectoral fleece, the giant blind, giant's blind hands blundering never found. Last of them all, my ram, the leader came, weighed by wool and me with my meditations, like high clobs patted them, him, and then he said, Sweet cousin ram, why lag behind the rest in the night cave? You never linger so, but graze before them all and go afar to crop sweet grass, and take your stately way, leading along the streams, until at le evening you run to be the first one in the fold. Why now so far behind can you be grieving over your master's eye? That carrion rogue and his accursed companion burnt it out when he had conquered all my wits with wine. Nobody will not get out alive, I swear. Oh, had your brain a voice to tell you where he may be now, dodging all my fury, bashed by this hand and bashed on this rock wall. His brains would strew the floor, and I should have rest from the outrage. Nobody worked upon me. He sent us into the open then. Close by, I dropped and rolled clear of the ram's belly. Going this way and that to untie the men, with many glances back, we rounded up his fat, stiff-legged sheep to take aboard and drove them down to where the good ship lay. We saw as we came near our fellows' faces shining. Then we saw them turn to grief, tallying those who had not fled from death. I hushed them, jerking ahead and eyebrows up, and in a low voice told them, Lo Load this herd, move fast, and put the ship's head toward the breakers. They all pitched in at loading, then embarked and struck their oars into the sea. Far out as far offshore as shouted words would carry, I sent a few back to the adversary. O oh, Kyclops, would you feast on my companions? Puny am I in a caveman's hands. How do you like the beating that you get, that we gave you, you damned cannibal? Eater of guests under your roofs, Zeus and the gods have paid you. The blind thing in his doubled fury broke. A hilltop in his hands and heaved it after us. Head of our black prow, it struck and sank, whelmed in a spuming geyser. A giant wave then washed the ship, stern foremost back to shore. I got the longest boat hook out and stood, fending us off with furious nods to all, put their backs into a racing stroke, row, row, or perish, so the long, long oars bent, kicking the foam sternward, making head until we drew away, and twice as far. Now when I cupped my hands, I heard the crow, crew, in low voices, protesting. God's sake, Captain, why bait the bet beast again? Let him alone. Looks up a little bit. That tidal wave he made on the first throw all but beached us, all but stove us in. Give him our bearing with your trumpeting. He'll get the range and law of a boulder. He'll smash our timbers and our heads together. Ah, he'll t smash our heads, timbers and our heads together. I would not heed them in my glorying spirit, but let my anger flare and yell. Kyclops, if ever mortal man inquire how you would have put to shame and blinded, tell him. Odysseus, raider of cities, took your eye, Laertes' son, whose home is on Ithaca. At this he gave a mighty sob and rumbled. Now comes the weird upon me, spoken of old, a wizard grand and wondrous lived here. Telemos, a son of Eurymos, right length of days he had in wizardry among the Kyclopes, and these things he foretold for time to come. My great eye lost, and at Odessi's hands always I had in mind some giant armed in giant force would come against me here. But this, but you, small, pitiful, and twiggy, you put me down with wine. You blinded me. Come back, Odessi's, and I'll treat you well, praying the god of earthquake to befriend you. His, uh, his son I am, for he, by his avowal, fathered me. And if he will, he may heal me of this black wound, he and no other. Of all the happy gods and mortal men, few words I shouted in reply to him. 
If I could make, take your life, I would, and take your time away, and hurl you down to hell. The god of earthquake could not heal you there. At this, he stretched his hands out in his, du in his darkness toward the sky of stars and prayed, Poseidon, oh, hear me, Lord, blue girdler of the islands. If I am thine indeed, and thou art father, grant that Odysseus, greater cities, never see his home. Laertes' son, I mean, who kept his hall on Ithaca, should destiny intend that he shall see his roof again among his family on his bed in his fatherland. Far be that day and mark the years between. Let him lose all companions or turn under strange sail the bitter days at home. In these words he prayed, and the god heard him. Now he laid hands upon a bigger stone and wheeled around Titanic for the cast to let it fly in the black proud vessel's trap. But it fell short just after the steering oar, and whelming seas rose giant above the stone to bear us onward toward the island. There, as we ran in, we saw the squadron waiting, the trim ships drawn up side by side, and all our troubled friends who waited, looking seaward, we beached out her grinding keel in the soft sand and waded in themselves and ourselves on the sandy beach then we unloaded all the kyclops flock to make division share and share alike only my fighters bowed voted that my ram the prize of all should go to him i slew him by the seaside and burnt his long thigh bones to zeus beyond the storm cloud chronos son who ruled the world but zeus is, zeus disdained my offering destruction for my ships he had in store and death to those who sailed them my companions now all day long, until the sun went down, we made our feast on mutton and sweet wine. Till after sunset and the gather in dark, we went to sleep above the wash of ripples. When the young dawn with the fingertips of rose touched the world, I roused the men, gave orders to man the ships, gassed off the mooring lines, and filing into sip side the rowlocks, oarsmen in line, dipped oars in the gray sea. So we moved on, moved out, sad in the vast offing, having our precious lives, but not our friends. It's the end of book 9. And in the next video we will get into book 10. We'll probably see where we're going to start summarizing and analyzing. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button. Subscribe, comment below, and hit that notification bell. As always, please stay safe and healthy. And you have a great night.